All right, we're going to take a look at Dice in the Pacific. Um, this is, of course, the follow-up of Dice at Sea. It's what we used to always uh, call the two of them. Um, and it's because War at Sea was actually, I think, the first of the buckets of dice type games. Which... I'm not terribly fond of, mainly because of the physical annoyance of rolling bunches of dice. But it's a fairly clean system where uh, it's just simple to hit rolls. No complex uh, saves on the, the hits and everything. So it's not too terrible, but battles could go on forever. All right, let me uh, talk a little bit about my past experience with this. I picked this up kind of at the end of the, okay, so I've gotten all the Avalon Hill games that really, really excited me. This one looks like it can be played solitaire. It's about the Pacific War. That's a, a rough, there aren't a lot of games that that's really the truth about, that it could be played easily solitaire. Uh, but it was low on my list at that point. Mm. It looked a little simplistic. It did beat out things like uh, Africa Core, which I only picked up used, and the other classics, because it was filling a niche that I had nothing for, I felt. Um, games like Flat Top, I felt too terrified that, like, that they'd be... Uh, like Midway, something that's very difficult to play solitaire. I've done Midway solitaire. I didn't do it on video because, you know, I don't know how much can be gained by a playthrough, and I wouldn't enjoy it that much. So I decided to that I was just going to put that one off and not do it. This one, however, has no real hidden information. Uh, it has it has an interesting uh, design to handle this strategic situation in a way that uses that. And when I first picked it up, I said, eh, it's kind of interesting, a little too light for my taste. But over the years, it's something that I've come back to a few times because it is kind of light. And when I'm in a mood like I am today, after having stressed and struggled with my taxes, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have like a three hour walk if I have to photocopy something, so. Uh, um, that did not help, and then doing multi-state is not pleasant either. Uh, but, so now with my great headache and my fatigue from yesterday, something like this feels like about the right level for me, or a Britannia or something along those lines. I want a lighter game, and this seemed like a good choice. So let's look at what the rules are. And... The basic of this, I've actually skimmed the rules, and I've played this a good deal over the years. Uh, the basic of this game is controlling these points of control. And they're going to be tracked over here as a cumulative value. You gain points each turn from territory, from sea areas you control. So each sea area is going to have, for example, Japan gets two points of control. If they control it, the Allies get one. There's three states an area can be in. It can be either a uh, sea area. It can be either uh, Allied controlled, Japanese controlled, or neutral. So the fact that there's two different values is actually important there. Uh, there are times when it's just important to prevent the other guy from getting control of something, and times when you want that control yourself. Uh, okay. And the little flags on the areas indicate who has control of the areas at the time. Somewhat related to this control is the positioning of bases and major ports. Uh, bases are smaller, and both bases and ports allow you to exert air influence over a sea area, whereas the major ports would require a significant effort to take. You might ask, well, how significant would Truck or Samoa take? Well, Truck was a fairly heavy effort to take. Uh, it was terribly well defended, but some other things were, too. Uh, your Okinawa... Uh, 
So it's kind of tough to say it should be classed the same as, say, Australia. But that's kind of besides the point. All right. In order to do this, you have your ships, and your ships have a number of values on them. This is their gunnery value. Second number is their armor. Third number is their speed. Okay. But some ships are going to have a number up here, and these are the aircraft carriers, and that's their airstrike value. We also have airplanes, which have, I believe, just uh, gunnery, essentially, and an armor factor. And somewhere or another, these OOBs, we have marines who have the full ship complement of values on them. But they're not going to have any guttery, obviously. Well, amphibious troops in general. You'll notice my map has some strange things on it. I was young when I got this, and uh, there were modifications suggested in one of the issues of the general I had. So I modified my game to have it. I don't know where the counters are for it. I've got them kicking around somewhere. For some reason, I stopped playing that modification. I'm not sure why. But certainly, uh, it added uh, a little bit of more historical basis to where and when the ships were, at least in one person's opinion. And, you know, that was kind of important at the time, but I didn't really realize sort of how abstracted and maybe iffy on the history of this game is in a lot of ways, even if it captures the feel of it fairly well. Anyhow, I don't have my general with me, so even if I could dig up the counters, I, I wouldn't be able to get it. And there are a number of these kind of modifications to this game. It was a popular enough system, being so light, uh, that, and, you know, compared to War at Sea, War at Sea has a very bad name in terms of being sort of just this dice fest, maybe unbalanced, this, that, and the other. Victory in the Pacific's always been kind of recognized as a good light war game. Um, okay. So, the sequence of play, first, each player gets to move their pieces, and that goes with the, in a series of pulses. Um, first, there's patrolling movement, where you're declaring that your ships are going out uh, to where they are in order to emphasize, in order to uh, exert control. Yeah, have a, I'm very fatigued by the taxes. In order to exert control over specific areas to flip the flags, essentially. And that's going to be marked by the ships coming out on their face-up side. Now, ships can only move two areas if they're trying to patrol. And if they have to move the second area, they have to do something known as a speed test. What a speed test is going to be is you're going to roll a die and you have to get uh, less than the speed on the ship. Okay, the third number on the ship. So these guys are fairly likely to succeed. These guys will always succeed. If the ship doesn't make the test, it'll be flipped over to its white side, and it'll still be present in the area, but it doesn't count for control of the area. It's able to fight in battles. It's able to prevent control from the other player, essentially. But it can't actually uh, be counted to give you control of the area. Now, you roll for each ship individually, so having some fast ships moving forward is good enough, usually. After you do that, each player alternates uh, by placing an air unit, okay? And we start with the Japanese there. Place one air unit. You can only place it in an area that's adjacent to one of your bases or ports, okay? So this is why, this is the only reason that the physical location of bases and ports is really important. It's where you can exert your, your ground-based air. But ground-based air is very, very valuable. First of all, it counts as patrolling. Secondly, it can't be affected by naval, uh, uh, by, by conventional naval surface units. It can be affected by aircraft carriers. They can air, uh, they can air attack it, but it can't be hit at all by the, uh, uh, by the regular fleets. 
Uh, I'm sure I had more to say, and I'm doing a terrible job in this because I'm so burned out. Uh, okay. Then the Japanese player moves his amphibious units, essentially his marines, and those, I don't remember how far they move. I think they can go two spaces. Yes, they can go two spaces, and they don't have to make any kind of speed roll. In fact, they have a speed factor, but that's only there for uh, evading military, e evasion after combat. Um, and then the third thing, well, the allies do theirs then. Then the third th uh, step, or fourth step, or something, I can't keep track, is the Japanese moves ships he wants to raid. Now, this is where the game gets a little weird. Uh... Again, you have this speed check. For the U.S. and Japanese, ships can move two spaces raiding without making a speed check. But they can go a third space raiding, okay, if they make their check. But if they fail, they go back to port. For the other allies, the Brits and the Australians, they can only go two spaces raiding. And I think they have to make a speed test on that second space. Which means it's kind of a... You don't want to reserve uh, the Brits and use them to try to interdict using this rating procedure. Because they might not even make their two spaces that you can normally use. <coughs> if you declare them as patrolling, they will automatically be in the area at least as raiders. On the downside of that, though, they have to telegraph their moves. And that's, I think, the intention here, because the U.S. was more capable of kind of hiding where they were from the Japanese. The Japanese were generally aware of where the Brits were, of course. The Japanese moving first all the time simulates magic and, and the various uh, uh, intelligence efforts of the Allies. Okay, when you get to... Uh, now, now you're done moving. You've done this pulse movement, and now it's time for combat. And the way combat works is, you know, like I said, it's buckets of dice. You're going to be grabbing. Oh, God. It's like I'm hungover because of doing these taxes. I mean, it's ruined my weekend. I'm considering taking tomorrow off work, even. I'm just so fatigued by it. All right. So, because it's buckets of dice, what you're going to be doing, but it's not a pure buckets of dice, it's a to hit roll system. Uh, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be rolling essentially one die per gunnery factor that you have, or per air fire factor, and you can see some of these get up there into the close to the battleship range. The white circle means you're going to get a plus one on the die roll, and your goal is to roll sixes. Every six that you roll, you're going to get to roll again, and that's how much damage you do to the ship that you directed your attack against. The Japanese are going to be declaring and rolling their attacks first, but they don't take effect immediately. The Americans, or the Allies in general, get to return fire before their ships take the effect. Now, there's two kinds of combat, day and night combat. Day combat is going to be limited just to air operations. Um, so, only your aircraft carriers and your patrolling ground-based air get to fire at all. And they can pick any targets they like. All the targets have to be assigned before you roll any dice. Night combats are going to be using only the gunnery factors. These are a little bit more complicated. The attacker, whoever's going to be assigning the die rolls, uh, God, I'm not making any damn sense. Assigns them by... Uh, I can't even figure out what I'm doing. Assigns them by uh, the number of... Yeah, I, I, I can't find my thought. Uh, let's try this again. You know, this is a really simple game. And it, the reason I'm playing it is because it's so damn simple. 
because I am so fucking burned out right now by the U.S. government. Uh, and more the state of Arizona. Minnesota's was very easy. All right. So, I have no idea where I am. But what you do is you declare, I'm attacking this ship. And you point to the ship you're attacking. So let's say the Japanese point to the Prince of Wales and say they're attacking it. But they had assigned them all beforehand. And what they do then is they grab a bunch of dice, they roll them. And however many sixes they get, they're going to roll that many dice to do damage. If they get any fives, they get this little X damaged marker on the enemy ship. And that indicates they've gotten some kind of critical sh hit that's going to force that ship to return. It's actually a bonus when you're losing a battle to get X's because it may be your only way out of the battle. All right. Uh, so yeah, that's the basics of that. But how do you decide if it's a day or a night battle? Well, both players choose. I think the Japanese have to choose first. They usually do. If they agree, they have that kind of battle. If they disagree as to what kind of battle they want to have, what kind of round they want to have, they roll a die. And you get, they each roll a die. And you get a plus one to your die roll if you control the sea area, and you get a plus one to the die roll if you want a day battle, because those were far easier to force. If you tie, you will get a day battle followed by a night battle before anything else happens. No chances to withdraw, etc. That's indicating a simultaneous action, a day uh, engagement at gunfire ranges. Oh, okay. If you exceed the armor factor of a ship, you have sunk it in general. Otherwise, each hit you do to a ship reduces its speed factor by one. If you hit the armor factor exactly even, you drop its gunfire down to one. After each round of battle, unless it's a day followed by a night combined round, essentially. And that's done first the day battle, then the night battle, but there's nothing in between them. Uh, each player has an option to retreat. Japanese first again. Now, if you retreat, what you do is you split your force up into little groups that you want retreating. And then the, the uh, other player has the option to pursue those forces and continue the battle forever. <laughs> um, ad infinitum as long as he can maintain a speed that is at least as good as the slowest speed of the retreating fleet's group now that's why you split your forces you can leave some of the slower stuff behind to delay the enemy and he may not want to pursue the faster stuff usually though you can't get away with everything usually the winning player of the battle has the capability to pursue just about anything you have. It's just a question of whether he wants to pursue with his faster ships. You'll notice fast carriers are important for this because they can keep the pursuit and win a decisive battle that way. The other side of it is, if you pursue, you will not be allowed to do an air raid. Air raids are the way that you knock out uh, ships in port. Usually, that's not a big concern. Usually, there's not a pile of enemy ships in the port. But, for Pearl Harbor, there is. Alright, what else? Ports and bases. When you return to port, you have to go uh, to a friendly island base that touches your sea area, or to any red port on the map. You can just sail as far as you like to rebase. There's a repair facet to the game, and I'm trying to remember how this works. Yes, you only repair ships if you spend the turn in that port. And the Japanese get six repair points here at Yokosuka. Uh, the Brits, I think, get one. I don't know where it's listed. One in Ceylon. It's listed in the rules, but I... I the Brits get one in Ceylon, I think. Uh, the U.S. gets a varying amount at Pearl Harbor. But if they lost Pearl Harbor, they can get them at Samoa again instead. That varying amount ranges 
starting for one on the first turn second turn it's three I think it's one on the first turn I don't know uh, and it goes up and gets up to 15 for the rest of the game starting with turn six Amphibious units, and yes, I wanted to explain this more fluidly, but the truth of the matter is, I don't think I'll hit everything that way. So I'm relying back on the rules. I thought I knew this well enough to just do it much more loosely than I usually do, but I just don't trust it. And since you're going to be watching the game, God knows you wouldn't be watching this shit. Uh, all right, amphibious units. So, the way these operate is between rounds of combat, you can dump them into a base, and that'll convert the base. If that's the last air base uh, capability that a player has, then their ground-based air in that sea area will leave. If they don't have another base that they could be flying into that area from. Even if they could counter-invade immediately afterwards. <clears throat> That's important because the Japanese get the first invasion chance. So sometimes the Allies will want to keep a garrison at ground areas rather than sit, uh, you know, move them around and try to use them. Oh, something I forgot in the naval combat. You can only shoot stuff that's shooting. Unless you cover every shooting ship with firepower of your own. In which case you can shoot carriers that aren't shooting or uh, uh, amphibious units. Oh. Okay. The red ports are harder to capture. The only way to capture them is to start the turn with control of the areas next to them and to keep it until it's assessed at the end of the turn. When it's assessed at the end of the turn, if you still have uh, control of the sea areas, that'll flip over and that will be a pretty major effect. Um, there's submarines in the game. There's two. The Japanese get one. And then when they lose that, at over here on turn seven, the Americans get the submarine power instead. What that allows you to do is after a round of combat, I think it's after, maybe you're allowed to before too. The rules are not terribly well laid out for me. Uh, they're easy enough, but um, the, uh, that player gets to make one shot with the submarine at uh, something that's in the water and then the submarine goes back to base. So it gives you a decent chance of a single shot. Okay. Allied fleets, this is where replacements go. The surprise attack. Pearl Harbor, you know, I can't fucking believe this. I've already gone through 24 minutes of video. I'm so crapped out. All right, I'm gonna split this because I wanna also get to the uh, optional rules too. Obviously, I should have stuck with something that nobody cared about, but... Alright, so the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor, how is this going to be handled? Well, this is going to be handled the way an air, air raid is handled. What that is, is the basics of an air raid is you're going to throw, uh, get two rounds of attack on the ships that are there in, in the harbor. And... Uh, disabled results don't have an effect. You don't roll for damage on amphibious units because they're kind of ground units there. They're well defended. Ash. I don't know. My damn camera doesn't work anymore. The battery. So it doesn't load up and it's dying here. Hopefully that will help. Make it so it doesn't die out completely. <sighs> I'm gonna have to go walk to get a camera someday, maybe, or give this shit up. All right. 
What do we got? I have no idea. I can't walk to the rolls. I'll throw them here on top of the game. Uh, okay, when a ship's in port, you can do multiple... You can do more damage to it than would normally sink it. Once you exceed its damage rating, that's fine. It can go up to double its armor factor uh, and still be on the bottom. And you can conceivably raise it up and repair it during normal using normal repair procedures. Now, if it's in a port where you don't have repairs, that doesn't much make sense. And yeah, it counts as sunk. Okay. So, the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor is a little different. You, the Japanese, uh, put a Pearl Harbor raid there in that space, I guess, or something. And they're going to be moving uh, things to the Hawaiian Islands as raiders. The only Allied ships on the first turn that can move are the five cruisers that are in port in Australia, Singapore, and somewhere else, uh, Philippines. Uh, combat will first be resolved in the Hawaiian Islands, and there's going to be a surprise attack, a two-round air raid against the ships and the air unit in Pearl Harbor. The Allied cruisers that are in the Hawaiian Islands are ignored for this. Yep, I'm going to have to set it up again because my damn camera is on a cord now. <sighs> hate having my whole weekend ruined by this crap. Alright. After that air raid, the Japanese can retreat or stay for more uh, combat. If they stay for more combat, the American ships that can sail out of Pearl Harbor. You roll randomly for these things, and one of the hardest things for me in this game is realizing this chart exists, and it may not have it. Yeah, it does. This is where it tells you where to put those location uncertain groups, W, X, Y, and Z, the carrier groups. It also tells you all the starting forces for the Allies, but those are letter-coded, so you can kind of guess where they go. The Japanese, are, all their setup is on this, their OOB. The uh, Americans and Allies are not all on there. Some of them are on the back of the road book, and quite often I think, well, where the hell's half the game? <laughs> uh, there is no reference to where it is that I, I recall. Certainly not that I saw from skimming. Okay. Um, so you roll for where those ships end up. If they end up in the Hawaiian Islands, they can fight. Or they could withdraw immediately, I believe. They're counted as patrolling wherever they show up. Um, as are any ships that come out of the Hawaiian Islands to fight. If the I-boat's available, it can make an attack immediately in the Hawaiian Islands. The Allies can then retreat, and they cannot be pursued if they retreat from, from the port. If the Japanese choose to stay, they can launch two more rounds of combat. Now, that combat can either be air raids if the Allies aren't there, if the American ships didn't come out, or if they ran away, or if there are ships there, they're going to be regular uh, rounds of day combat, I believe, automatically. No, I think you get to roll for it. I'm not sure. Um, and then the Japanese have to retreat, and the Allies are allowed to pursue if they haven't retreated. Okay. In Indonesia, the Allies get to do an air raid on the ships here. Yeah, all the special rules come out at the beginning of the game. You know, So it's like the things you use once that you have to look up every time, you have to look up right at the beginning. And then the rest of the game kind of flows the way it always does. So every time you play it, if you're me, and you play it every couple of years or something, you have to kind of work through this part. But the rest of the game is very simple. Um, 
So Japanese can use land-based air on this air raid. Normally you can't use land-based air on an air raid and because the ships are actually at sea here. The allied ships and units can be attacked even though they're at sea. And Disables are ignored for this particular raid, but you can't get double damage. You're not in a port. And then after Indonesia, we go to the regular sequence of play for the rest of the game. And my battery is not recharging. This thing's fucking ruined. Okay. Well, I was going to go over the optional rules, but I think my camera's about to die here. Something's going on. Got a little folded up piece of cardboard underneath the power thing. We'll see if that works. I don't know if that'll help. It seems to be juicing it continuously now. All right, what about optional rules? There are a number of different optional rules on this thing. First of all, the game can be extended to nine turns. It's normally an eight turn game. On the ninth turn, we got some additional ships. Most importantly, additional ships for the Japanese, a couple extra carriers that show up at the end of the game. Um, the Japanese also get kamikaze attacks where they get the attack bonus but whatever attacks is eliminated. Oh, I didn't explain what happens to air units when they're eliminated. The ground-based air, the marines, etc., when they're eliminated, they come back two turns later. Ships when they're eliminated are gone, obviously. Um, I like this rule. It extends the game a little bit. Uh, Japanese gets an extra POC each turn they control the Japanese island, and one extra POC each turn they control Indonesia. Overall, stretching the game out but giving these extra points supposedly gives an advantage to the Japanese. Next one's Pearl Harbor. Additional rules for this. I don't usually play with this one. Usually I play with three of them. The nine turn game, the gunnery radar, and the damage control. And I think I'm going to do that again here. The Pearl Harbor one... No, I like this one too. Uh, the Pearl Harbor one, the Japanese can assign no more than ten ships to Pearl Harbor. Uh, on the first round of the air raid, they add one to each shot's die roll. If the 7th Air Force survives, it can come out and attack the Japanese. <coughs> I assume it can be shot back as well. That's not clarified in there. Um, the Japanese, if the Japanese stay after the air raid, the first extra round of combat is a day action following special rules. That's where I thought that was. Uh, the Japanese uh, names his targets, including targets in the location on certain thing. He does this secretly before the Americans declare what they've got. If the target retreats before combat, the carrier does nothing and loses that initial round of attacking. This is to make things tougher on the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor working. So the Japanese sometimes are criticized for breaking off. Well this gives some of the reasons behind that. Uh, if Japanese carriers can attack targets in Pearl Harbor, even if the Allies have units at sea, on the second round of combat and thereafter, play proceeds as it was normally. Gunnery radar in turn 7 and thereafter, undamaged United States ships with a gunnery factor of 3 or more get an attack bonus. So, so far we're handing over a medium allied and a, a small... Uh, allied bonus for a Japanese media, uh, small bonus. It makes me want to do the task forces one, which will even it out. Let's go to damage control, which we're definitely doing as well. Uh, we, If I can remember, we subtract damage against the British 027 carriers or against the Taiho or Shinano. Now, the British 027 carrier is affordable, indomitable. Uh, because they have an armored flight deck. Uh, uh, 
Now, similarly, starting on turn four, you subtract from damage against U.S. carriers with an airstrike of four. All right, so the task forces rules, this is the one that I have the toughest time actually getting around to playing with. Um, it allows, because it's kind of secret. Each player, uh, maybe, I don't know. It's kind of more complicated. And one of the reasons you, I play this game is, Jesus, I'm burned out. I don't want to do something heavy. I feel like just chucking some dice. It's not that there's no thought in this game, but there's no complexity to it usually. And this is adding, other than the first turn. The first turn is complicated. But once you play that first turn, it's like a Britannia type game. You're just kind of moving pieces and rolling dice and la 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 la. Uh, so, what you do with this is you set the task forces to a task in each round of combat. Landing, searching, or hiding. And the chance of sighting it is increased on basis. So, for example, if it's landing, it's automatically sighted. If it's searching, it's sighted on a 1 through 4. If it's hiding, it's sighted on a 1 or 2. Uh, then you determine the type of round, and you'll continue. However, during a day action, hiding task forces cannot attack, and only sighted task forces can be attacked. A hiding task force that is sighted can be attacked but cannot attack. And a searching or landing force that is not sighted can attack without being attacked. Well, a landing one is sighted. Uh, at night, any task force that is both hiding and unsighted cannot attack and cannot be attacked. Any task force that is either searching, landed, or sighting can attack or be attacked. During both day and night, an amphibious unit can land only if it is in the landing task force. The basic game basically assumes that you're always in this landing mode. But this adds some ability to hide uh, to the thing. And I think I'm going to give it a shot this time. Alright. Uh, let's try playing this. And I apologize for this intro. I'm not going to recut it because, well, everybody should share some of my pain.